Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day today so far. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, quantifiers, about the Cartesian product, about functions and sets associated with the function, several different kinds of sets that we associate with a function, and some different properties of functions that are important to us. And then we'll do uh, a number of examples that will kind of bring out some of the ideas uh, that we've developed before we do the examples. So that's where we're going to go today. And so uh, let's get started. So I'm going to write um, S of X to mean uh, this is a this is going to be a statement about whatever X is and in fact I should say that a different way uh, it's not a statement that is true Let's actually rewrite that just a little bit here. Uh, statement about X is true. Uh, you might no, you'll note the difference, I think, as we go along. Um, so this is, when I write S of X, this just means we've got some statement about X, and there'll be particular instances that uh, we'll see where we have statements about something, and I'll just use S of X as a kind of shorthand for that, and I'll use P of X to mean X has property P, where P is some property. And I think these will be, become clear what it is we're talking about as we start to use these notions, uh, probably pretty quickly, in fact. So, the first thing we want to do today is to talk about quantifiers, logical quantifiers. We will see these in a little more detail shortly, uh, another couple of lectures, I think, uh, when we start talking about proofs, how to do proofs, uh, truth tables, and related ideas. For today, we're just going to be presenting the notion of universal and existential quantifiers. So when we write this upside down A, for all elements of some arbitrary set, capital X, uh, that S of X, this says, for every X, S of X is a true statement. St this statement about X is true. Or I could substitute in here a P and say, for every X in capital X, X has the property P. That is what we call the universal quantifier. Then we have the existential quantifier, which says there exists an X here, such that the S of X. So let's actually put this in here. And I should have written this out in, in, in words, I think. So this would say for every X in X, X of S, S of X is true. This would say there is some X, there exists an X element of capital X. So there exists, whoops, <laughs> an A and X. That's not going to work. There exists an X, an element of capital X, such that uh, S of X is a true statement about it. And now there's a third, not really ex exactly a, a, a new, different quantifier, but slightly different. We would say this backwards E with an exclamation point, X in X, that would say the same thing as up here, except where it says an, we would now substitute a unique. So this statement, and by the way, notice that I've said this is a statement about x. 
So this is a statement about X. And then I've referred to this as a statement. They're both statements. This is a statement about X. This whole thing here is not a statement about X. This is a statement about capital X. It says there exists a unique element of capital X for which this statement is true. Or if I had P in here, it'd be there exists a unique element of capital X that has property P. So this statement with the quantifier is, and the same here and the same here, those are each statements about capital X. And here we have a statement about one of the elements. So the over here on the right, the X is kind of like a variable or a dummy, a dummy variable. I could, instead of having X, I could put Z here and then there exists a unique Z in capital X for the same fixed set capital X. There exists a Z such that, such that the statement about Z is true. So what I've got in here isn't so important. What's important in the statement is what set X we're talking about. And that'll become clear in just a moment when we do several examples. So both of these are what we call existential quantifiers. So in each case, these are quantifiers. We say they, they quantify the statement over here by saying there's one or for everyone. So let's look at some examples here. So uh, first, let's uh, look at the uh, statement that says for every x in R, x squared is greater than or equal to zero. That's, we know that's true. So let's put T here. By the way, let me, uh, let me take this back off. And I'm doing that just so that when I'm working over here, I can see you. <laughs> you can see me. Okay. So uh, this statement is a true statement about the real numbers. That's why I put T in to circle it. That's just a shorthand, ad hoc for the moment shorthand here. True, and I'll circle F if it's false. Uh, so this is a statement about real numbers. And then this statement here is just a statement about a particular X. And this says for every particular X, its square is non-negative. Let's look at another statement here. For every x uh, in R, x squared is positive. Well, that's false because zero is a real number. Zero squared is not positive. Let's look at another statement. Let's say here we have for all n in the set of natural numbers, for every natural number, uh, one summed up one, two, three, four, out to n, the sum of the first n natural numbers is n times n plus one over two. That's true, and you probably already know that, or you could, in a sense, verify it for yourself pretty quickly, but we're actually gonna go through a, a, a proof of this that will be instructive, even though it's easy. Uh, but we're not gonna do that today, we'll do that next time or shortly thereafter when we're talking about truth tables, proofs, and that will be where we talk about proof by induction when we do this. Uh, let's uh, look at another quantified statement, and this is going to be an existence statement. We'll say uh, there exists, uh, whoops, <laughs> that's not what I want. <laughs> uh, there exists an x squared. Well, we could do that, but here it's going to be that there exists an x in uh, R such that x squared equals 25. It's supposed to be a 5 there, 25. So, of course, that's true. Now let's look at the statement, there exists a unique x in R such that x squared equals 25. That's false because, of course, 5 squared is 25 and minus 5 squared is 25. So it's not true that there's a unique x 
here that does this. So this is false. Let's look at another one similar. Let's say there exists um, an N. In fact, let's put in here unique. There exists a unique N in N. In fact, let's make that an X because it's not like we have to use N in the natural numbers and we have to use X's in the real numbers. So let's just take this off and let's replace it with there exists a unique X in N such that X squared equals 25. So I've got the same statement on the right hand side. That is the same, the same statement is being quantified in each of these three existential statements, but sometimes true, sometimes the overall statement is true, and sometimes it's false. So again, see this is th these, the, the statements here, the whole statement, the whole existential statement is not a statement about X. It's a statement about the real numbers, statement about the real numbers, statement about the natural numbers, and of course this one is true because there does exist only one natural number whose square is 25. And then let's look at there exists an X in uh, R such that, uh, let's not make it in R, let's make it in uh, the natural numbers. In fact, let's make it in Z, the set of integers, just to throw in a little variation here. So there exists an X in Z such that X squared equals 2. And of course, that's false. So, uh, actually, let's do a couple more. Let's uh, say uh, for every, so this is something we actually uh, did I believe, uh, already in the first lecture, we'll say that for every x and y in Rn, so now I'm, I've got vectors and I'm adding up vectors, that's, ve that's going to be vector or n-tuple addition, uh, this is equal to y plus x. True. How about for every x and y in R, x times y. So this is R, this is Rn. So x times y, two real numbers, is equal to y times x. Also true. And of course, this is just the property that addition in Rn, multiplication in R, are both commutative operations. Uh, but let's look at one more here. Let's say uh, for, a, for every uh, A and B in the set. So this is just a notation for the set of all n by m, n by n square uh, matrices. And so here I'm going to have A, B equals B, A. So that would be the commutative property for matrix multiplication, but of course that's false. So now whenever we have a statement like this, or really an existential statement, either one, uh, but, but it's easiest to see, I think, to start with for the universal statements like this. If this says, for every pair of n by n matrices, for every pair of square matrices of the same dimension, that the, doesn't matter wh which order we take the product in, we get the same thing, the commutative property. To show that's false, we want a counterexample. And a counterexample, since this says this is true for every pair of matrices, a counterexample, we don't, all we need for a counterexample is one example, that is 1A and 1B, which when we do the multiplication in either order, we get different results. And in fact, I think, you can check me on this, I think this A and this B
uh, are, comprise a counterexample. Because if I multiply A, B, I get one resulting two by two. And if I multiply B times A, I get a different resulting two by two. So this, together with showing that indeed we get different results for the product, that is what we mean by a counterexample to the whole universal statement, universal, universally quantified statement here. And again, notice that all kinds of things can show up as the variables, if you like, the entities that are being quantified. Here I have x as my kind of dummy variable in the quantification. Here I have lowercase n, and that's often we use that for natural numbers. Um, and down here I have capital A and capital B because we typically use capital letters like that for matrices. Um, anything could show up, sets could show up in there, all kinds of things. And that will happen, I believe, several times in the rest of today's lecture. So I'm going to take this off now and we will uh, use the space to do something else.